Today's guest is Bill Carvalho, the founder and CEO of Wild Planet. So if you've ever bought Wild Planet tuna or any of their seafood products, this is the guy who started it all back in 2001. And he's going to tell his story of how he decided and why he decided to do things differently in the fishing world. And holy smokes, I got exactly what I was hoping for in this interview. So if you're at all curious about what's happening with fishing and practices that really honestly, like made me want to vomit thinking about like, as he was describing what happens in the oceans today and then how they're doing it differently, was just so exciting. You guys know, I love regenerative agriculture and I see these guys as the same kind of energy and what they're doing with, and the way they are fishing in the oceans. So not only that, but we're going to get into why you might be interested from a health perspective on buying these kind of meats instead of what you're going to get as like cheap tuna at the grocery store. It's all the nitty gritty. We're talking everything from omega threes to protein, to how they process it, uh, to mercury content and all of it. And just, wow. So i um, grateful to bill for doing what he did and bringing such an amazing product to pretty much every, uh, higher end <laughs> health store, whole foods, uh, natural grocers, all those guys sprouts. And then also you can find them in, in Kroger stores. You can find, wild planet just about anywhere as well as on amazon so you're about to get educated you ready <laughs> okay here is bill carvalho before we get in the show i wanted to make sure that you guys knew about two awesome things that i have going on right now in my company the first is my next hire retreat which is going to be in maui hawaii this is may 10th through 14th please check it out at taragarrison.com slash retreat and it will redirect you to that page this is going to be focused all on physical health. So my retreats from now on will be focused on one of our four peaks of hire, which are personal, physical, professional, and people, which are like the four key areas of life that we focus on. And this retreat is all focused on physical. So we're doing a biohacking buffet, a biomechanics class, the mindsets behind physical transformation you might be missing. We're also doing health the way I feel like it should be done. And that is having fun, playing outside, hanging out with cool people. We're going to be surfing, spending some time at the beach, hula dancing, so many amazing things. So if you want to check that out again, it's taragarrison.com slash retreats. And, um, the other thing is a new coaching offer that I have. I'm very excited about this. This is my path to being able to help more people. And so I have offered a group coaching form of higher coaching. What that involves is a private coaching community, a group coaching call with me once a week. And you also get access to my coach Tara app included in this and access to every single program that I have ever released all in a vault for my higher coaching clients. So very excited about that. It is only $297 a month. So significantly discounted from my private coaching. So if that's interesting to you, please check it out at taragarrison.com. You'll just see it right there on my homepage, or you can go directly to the taragarrison.com slash higher dash coaching. All right, let's go ahead and get into the show. Okay. So Bill, thank you so much for taking the time to educate us. I know a lot of my audience is probably consumed. They're probably consumers of wild planet. And if you guys aren't, you should be <laughs> just being real. And I, I, you know, I told you, I've been using your products forever and really appreciate you guys existing. Right. Um, and I noticed on your website right there on wildplanetfoods.com, it says sustainability starts with respect we exist for one reason because of our reverence for ocean life, which really spoke to me. And I was wondering if you could speak about that. Like, what, what does that mean? What is the mission behind wild planet? Sure. Tara, um, back in 2001, I had, uh, uh, an epiphany while attending the Monterey Bay Aquarium seafood watch, sorry, the, the Monterey, the Monterey Bay, uh, Bay Aquarium, uh, exhibit, which was entitled something to the effect of uh, Oceans in Crisis. So at the time, I was the sole proprietor of a company called Carvalho Fisheries. And, and I had 11 years experience in the seafood industry as a primary producer of, of crab, tuna, salmon, rockfish. Uh, and, and I was aware of what was going on as an industry insider. Uh, mm. What really happens at, at sea, which is not too bad in the U.S., it, but is really bad uh, around the world. And that um, visit to the aquarium, I had a, at the time, the kids were all uh, small. And the, the visit there just touched me 
-hmm. in that I realized uh, this is the world in which I play. This is where I work. This is what I do. And my personal ethics and, and, and a spiritual view of life is that, that, that life is sacred and should be respected. And a life form should not be taken unless it's for the purpose of sustaining mm. our life. And mm. any, any take and, and wanton waste of other life forms to me is, is a violation of morality. So mm. Mm. There, at that time, I made the decision to, to make a, a pivot to only fisheries that practice the, the um, uh, fishing that complies with the Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch criteria hmm. of no wasteful bycatch, uh, no harm done to the environment, and only sourced from, from uh, a healthy biomass stocks. And mm -hmm. so from that time on, uh, I made that pivot, discontinued certain things, struggled financially in, and in 2004 realized I had to make a change to uh, to a different brand name that resonated with the uh, this idea of eco-friendly uh, product sourcing. And I say eco-friendly because at the time the word sustainable wasn't even being used yet in 2001. And that's when wow. Wild Planet was created in 2004. Wow. Yeah, that resonates with me a lot. I'm very connected to Mother Earth and feel that same sense of um, stewardship and respect and gratitude. And um, it hurt, it truly like hurts my heart to see how little gratitude, I feel like it centers in gratitude um, and connection and how that is not present in a lot of the way things are being run in the world today. And I'm curious, like as somebody who's, I'm totally ignorant <laughs> in terms of what's happening in the, the fisher, the fishing world, you know, uh, commercial fishing as could you give us a brief, uh, you know, I don't know how much you're willing to share, but the things that really bothered you the most in terms of what exists in that world. Well, the idea that, that a human being could go out in the middle of the sea where no one is watching and could take all he can or she can, regardless of what was injured, use any method possible to maximize the financial return of the taking of these uh, pristine ocean sea creatures, mm -hmm. irrespective of how many you sort through and dump over dead, that really bothered me. Yeah. And especially a video that I saw where, where the tuna fleets back in the day, and this still goes on to some extent, but it's been curbed you know, with, with efforts to, to really uh, improve practices. But the, uh, in the old days, and, and it still happens today, tuna fleets would catch a lot of sharks. And they still catch a lot of sharks if they use the wrong method of a fishing. Which I have a feeling we're going to get into in a bit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and these 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 individuals would cut all the fins off of the shark while alive and throw it back into the sea. That is is a a universal tragedy. Yeah. That that cannot be tolerated and. Who wants to participate and partner with with the producer of those goods that end up in a can that makes us accomplices with right. with those practicing that? So totally. uh, I I wanted to be completely severed and yeah. and and dis and distinguished from from that whole thing mm. and how we source product. Just curious, why were they cutting the fins off the sharks? Well, oh, why? Yeah. They're worth a lot of money uh, for yeah. shark fin soup yeah. in Southeast Asia. I see. Mm -hmm. Wow. Don't wow. don't eat Tara. Don't eat shark fin soup. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've never had it, and I never will. Now, <laughs> thanks for letting me know what's going on. Yeah. That, and so, um, 
what was this transition like for you? That must have been scary. If there's if no one in the you never even heard the word sustainable, all you're navigating foreign soil like completely on your own. It's not like you had a model, I'm assuming. Like what was that transition like for you? Well, I was inspired by the uh, David and Lucille Packard Foundation organization. Okay. Of course, that, you know, that's the Packard of Hewlett Packard. And they mm-hmm. put a lot of, of their trust, fortune into sustainable seafood mm-hmm. uh, resources, education, funding mm-hmm. companies that, that have a mandate to source only sustainable seafood. And so, uh, I had that as, as a, as a, a North star for me, not Very just cool. my personal morality and my, what my heart was telling me, but what, uh, uh, their science produced, I was able to, to see this roadmap and, uh, there was no choice. It, it wasn't a choice because it was, it was the trendy thing to do. It was what consumers were demanding. And now I needed to greenwash myself to be more acceptable. No, right. This was before <laughs> anybody knew that there was the greenwashing needed anywhere. Mm-hmm. But, it, but uh, uh, I used their science and and I fed off of their passion uh, at the Monterey Bay uh, Seafood Watch organization. And there were other organizations as well. Uh, Greenpeace is very much uh, in a leadership position when it comes to to really bringing issues of sustainability to the fore. And so uh, I, I stand on their shoulders and simply was a person that that took what they were advocating for and created the vehicle for yeah. consumers to then choose that. Because what good yeah. does advocacy do if there's never a choice on shelf that is right. that is, that 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 actually moves the needle at the retail level because mm-hmm. that's what will move the, the 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 excuse me that that's what will move the needle at the fishing level ultimately yep, yep. Yeah, yep. that's how I always I, I always say your dollar is the best voting power you have if you want to see change in the world vote with your dollar, vote with what you buy. Cause if the market, if you like, for example, you know, I, I, I'm very into regenerative agriculture. I'm like, it's not that I don't ever have meat from a CAFO. I do. Sometimes that happens. I'm at a restaurant, it, you know, it, it happens, but for the most part, I want to see that die. So I definitely am trying as hard as I physically can to not support that industry and to support regenerative. And it's the same thing. That's why I buy your guys's stuff because it's, it's voting. I mean, it's better for me. I always say it's, it's, a, it's selfish and selfless. It's good for the planet. It's good for the animals. And it's also better for me too, because <laughs> it's better quality, and, you know, <laughs> and it, it's good for, for your yet to be grandchildren who, who are going to need right. Right. organic soils and, and prolific life left in the oceans. Exactly. Exactly. Oh, okay. So sustainable, th- this process of fishing, what does it mean? What, what's the, I mean, obviously you guys aren't cutting fins off of sharks, but you know, yeah. what, uh, what yeah. else, you know, I'm just curious, what's the difference in the way you guys do things versus like maybe the, like the worst of the worst, like what is the parallel or the juxtaposition of those two processes look like? Right. Good question. Well, the word that really governs the answer to that question is selective. Mm. Now, it used to be that 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 most fisheries were were smaller scale and they were quite selective. Uh, boats would tuna boats, for example, would go out with binoculars and look for a school of tuna that were all the right size, and they would they would select that and they would target that. And that was what they were looking for. That's, that was a mature school of tuna. They did the best they could to capture what they could of that school. That's, you know, that's selective, even though it's using a net. And with that net comes a certain amount of, of catch of other things that might be swimming with the tuna. And that net doesn't allow you to necessarily release alive whatever you caught uh as 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 bycatch the 
a better, more selective method to catch tuna is what we use, what, what we, what our fishermen use. I'm not going to say we use it because we don't have any boats. We, but we partner with boats that do the right, the best thing. Mm -hmm. And that is to fish one by one with a pole and a line and a hook. One fisherman, wow. one pole, one line, one hook. These guys take live anchovies with them in a tank of seawater on their boat. And they go out and they find a school of fish. And then they start throwing these live anchovies out. Huh. And they also spray water on top of that to make it look like there's a big school of anchovies kind of boiling. Wow. There. And the wow. tuna come up in a frenzy and, and some eat an anchovy, but most of them end up biting on what looks like an anchovy with a barbless hook on it attached to the pole that the fishermen puts in the water. And these guys are just yanking these tuna in one after another wow. aboard the vessel and they go and they're, they're, they're only catching those tuna that come to the surface. Now, just uh, last week, I was told that there were some mahi-mahi caught um, among the fishermen here in, in Washington state. And, and there were about 12 mahi-mahi. And that was big news because they never catch anything but albacore tuna. Mm. but they they caught the mahi mahi now what happened to the mahi mahi that's the issue they didn't injure them and toss them back over dead to be wasted they brought them in and and the guy at the dock in in westport washington bought them from the fishermen and took them to his restaurant and served them as fish and chips to the tourists and so so that's that's selective fishing yeah. And if you catch something that's, that you weren't intending and it's not endangered, like a mahi-mahi is not, you, you retain it also mm. for utilization. That's, that's full retention fishing. Wow. So online line fishing that retains everything, everything caught is brought in and is utilized for food. And, the, and that maximizes the meals for the effort and the catch yeah. that's going on. By contrast, now those boats that used to use binoculars to find schools of tuna, there's a much more effective way to do it. It's called a fish aggregating device. Mm -hmm. The acronym is FAD. That is a floating device. Usually it has a bunch of nets uh, under it. And this they've learned since about the 80s that if you float something out there in the middle of the open sea, fish will aggregate to that because the small fish come thinking, hey, here's some protection. I can like get under this, this mass of seaweed. Well, it's not seaweed. It's a man-made device that's floating there. Mm -hmm. The small fish aggregate to that. Bigger fish see that. They all come pretty soon. Sharks are swimming around, checking it out. The, everything that was scattered over many square miles of ocean are now bunched up mm. under this floating thing and a school of tuna comes by and they say hey this is a party we're going to hang out now on that floating device is i'm sorry to give you a big brain dump here but no i love it i love it thank you okay <laughs> but on this floating device is always a a radio beacon for its location so the fishermen can go find it again mm. many of them have also a sonar uh, 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 device that communicates back to the boat the density of the aggregation of fish underneath it. Mm. So the fisherman doesn't even have to, to come back and check and see if there are any fish there. He knows where the, where the bunches of fish are. Now, mm. they come back to that, to that bunch of fish. It's not like the old days with the binoculars where they have a school of tuna all the same size. Now, all the tiny baby tuna that are only a pound. These are fish that could have been caught at 80 pounds. These tiny tuna are mixed in here. Mm. All kinds of species are in there. There are turtles, there are sharks. Oh, wow. And they wrap this whole thing with a purse say net and, they, wow. and then the purse on the bottom tightens. And now it's all crowded toward the boat and the fish actually have a certain amount of 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 uh, oxygen deprivation before they even get to where they're scooped out of there and they're scooped and they're sorted the tuna are, are that are big enough are kept 
everything else is dumped overboard. Much of it already dead, some of it dying, stressed. I mean, that is a real problem. Wow. Because now it's not selective and it's not full retention. Those are the two bywords really that that drive uh, what what I want to do in our sourcing policy. Yeah, I can see why you had a big heart moment. Like I can't, that just makes me want to cry. Like my whole heart just like drops thinking of these. It's just in needless killing for, you know, it's horrible. So thanks for educating us on that. And would you say that like, so if you go to, let's say you go to Walmart and you buy the cheapest can of tuna there, it's all that stuff pretty can you how do you it is right like what what's how do you know besides you guys you know what i'm saying like in terms of because i i know this is a thing for people they're like well i can get that can of tuna for 70 cents or i can pay pay, pay you know 3.99 4.99 for something that looks better but they don't know why you know what because so could you educate on the difference and the best that you can i know it's a little tricky to answer it is tricky because <laughs> you know we don't like to impugn yeah other people but right. uh if a can does not make a claim that it's yeah. online caught or right. or troll caught which is also dragging lures through the ocean catching them okay. one at a time that's troll a little, caught t-r-o-l-l not to be confused with trawl <laughs> r-a-w-l okay one of the worst things ever oh no <laughs> yeah, yeah. So troll and troll are really okay. at the uh, at, at different ends of the spectrum. That's right. Okay. So if it doesn't say like, what'd you say? Single line caught? Is that what it will say? Pull in line or troll caught. If it doesn't okay. say that on the can, then then that they don't have anything that they can say. Yeah. Then you just don't that. know. <laughs> it's probably not the probably greatest sure. catch methods, right? Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. In terms of health, you know, in terms of the nutrient density or anything like that, is there a health difference between these types of products or? Yeah, that's, a, there is. Um, and this goes back to my childhood when uh, I canned tuna in my Portuguese family, my grandparents canned tuna themselves. They, they mm, went wow. to the, in Eureka, California every year and, and they got maybe 400 pounds of tuna and brought it back wow. to their, to their out their their garage kitchen, because all the Portuguese wow. have two kitchens, one in the garage for the fish wow. and the one in the house just for show. Oh, but, respect. That's so cool. Yeah. <laughs> so, so everybody, the whole family was there just cutting up tuna, putting tuna in glass jars and canning it. Wow. in pressure cookers mm -hmm. and then that's what we ate you know growing up and wow, and, cool. and so it, in 1998 when i got into the tuna business i realized hey i could do this i could have someone commercially mm -hmm. do that and that was the last year that my wife and i and and my brother and sister-in-law and you know, you know carrying on that tradition that was the last year we canned tuna for ourselves because from then on I had all this tuna in these little cans. Yeah. It's, it's pure meat put in the can with just salt, no water, no oil, nothing. That tuna is not cooked yet. It's, it's raw. And then the lid goes on and it's cooked in the pressure cooker. Mm. Well, that's, the, that's what we do on a commercial level uh, at the canneries that we use. The primary cannery we use is an, is an American owned cannery in Vietnam. And what, what happens is that meat has a certain amount of moisture and fat in it that, that purges or releases during the cooking process, like anything. And it's essentially roasting that tuna in the can. And so when you open the can, you've noticed this, Tara, where yeah. all you know, the juices come out and you can see that it's, it's, it's liquid and it's fats. And well, that's the really, really good stuff. Mm -hmm. By contrast, the the industrial version of canned tuna looks like this frozen tuna comes into port they defrost it at some some country where the labor is is you know it's more efficient they defrost it they cook it then 
they clean that cooked fish because cooked fish is so much easier to scrape the skin and and, and to just mm. set it up is it, super easy compared to to cutting up raw fish like we totally. do. Right. They 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 cut all that up. They take that cleaned meat, the big pieces, the chunks, and then the flake, and they pack those in twenty two pound vacuum seal bags, and they freeze them. Okay. Now they ship them to the United States or to other countries, and the cannery will rip those packages open and and dump those packages into the mechanized tuna packer. Oh my gosh! Right, you know, after they defrost it, of course, and then it gets packed into the can. Now the problem is that that first cooking process that was done before there was it was cleaned, all the purging of the liquids happened already before right. so now this meat is dried out and so it's it's a necessity to add liquid whether water or oil wow. to hydrate otherwise it'll stick and burn to the can and wow. so what you end up having in that case which is most of the tuna in the united states you have a product that was frozen twice and cooked twice you know our our process the fish is frozen once and cooked once. I yes. can great. I could do a great illustration if you want. Yeah, let's go. <laughs> that, that is fascinating. Thank you for explaining that. I had no. I didn't know. I didn't know how that all worked. So thank you. I get it now. But you knew it was different because the texture yeah. is so different, right? It's so different. So different. It's not even funny. And I always wondered why it's in oil and all. Now I get it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So so here's the here's the analogy. You're going to have a. a a a a grass fed grass finished prime rib, prime rib roast dinner. Mm -hmm. You take the prime rib roast and you bake it. Takes a long time. I yeah we haven't done that in years. I hardly eat beef, but <laughs> but the drippings from that roast go into the dripping pan. Nobody, when that roast is finished, takes that roast away throws the drippings away, cuts it up, and then puts it in a stock pot of water <laughs> and boils it. Right. And then serves those pieces to their, you know, to their guests. No, right. <laughs> you the once cooked prime rib roast and you utilize those drippings yeah. because that's where the flavor is. And it's the same thing with a right. can of planet tuna. You're getting a tuna right. roast with its juices all in the can, which is why it's just worth so much more than the competition's Wow, price. that's such a great illustration. Yeah. The thought of taking your finished prime rib and putting it in boiling water is like, no. No. But it's the same thing. That's exactly what you just described. It's the same thing. That's like so gross. <laughs> that, that tuna that's already been cooked before right. now it is, is packed in water is is boiled in that little can for 70 minutes. Wow. Okay. okay. Other question I had for you, cans, the, the cans, the pouches, you know, the, the, can you educate us on what for consumers, what's, what should we be aware of? Yeah, well, um, the, the cans that we use today, uh, I don't know of any manufacturer for tuna or sardine or salmon products or any other fish products that still uses BPA okay. as, a, as a component of the lining. Now the can has to have some kind of lining material because if, it, if there was no lining, then the, the fish would be in contact with metal. Yeah. And you don't, and that is right. So, um, so a low acid protein needs, a lining. The lining is comprised of a, a various. I mean, you know, uh, there's no nice way to put this, Tara. It it is a lacquer lining that is composed of plasticizers, and the government has studied this, and especially European governments have stricter regulations. The cans that we use are are cans that are compliant with European BPA standards uh, or BPA free standards. Yeah, yeah. And so um, what are the, the other 
particular components of that lining? Well, those are, you know, that's a valid question. And there are people that, that eat tuna in glass jars. You're talking to one of them. <laughs> you know, we have a great tuna that we produce that's, it's in a four and a half ounce glass jar. Mm. And, and to me, that's the best, but then I'm spoiled because I was raised on glass jar tuna. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. My mom was, my mom was kind of a, a hippie, I'd say that way. So she did a lot of canning and I like just thinking of that, like brings me a lot of joy. Cause I know it, it's, it's just, there's something about taking something fresh from nature and canning it right there yourself. It's just, it, there's nothing like it. it. It's just, it's, you know, that it just is, it's not, it's beyond just knowing that it came straight from nature. It's like the, the heart connection that you have to that food, the love that went into preparing it, you know, and that's basically what I'm sensing from you guys is you're, you're mimicking that, that you grew up with your family. You're like, it's like, let's just do it the right way. Why, let's just put some salt in here and can it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and when I did that in 2001, I started doing this uh, canning product for the Carvalho fisheries name. Mm -hmm. It happens to be my last name, but it, it, it doesn't resonate the the eco-friendly thing but when i started doing that people said no one is ever going to buy a can of tuna that costs what you have to charge for it to do this mm, wow and it, and i read this book at the time it was a fairly recent book at the time it was called blue o blue ocean strategy mm. and the blue ocean strategy was a marketing um uh approach that that says don't swim in the red waters where there is price competition bloodletting. Mm. You, you won't make any money going into that. And that described perfectly yeah. the U.S. big three brand price competition. Everybody is just discounting, 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 right. and then finding ways to kind of cut costs to the max, mm -hmm. it says, go to the blue waters. And, and here's the line that really stuck with me. And it said, make your product so differentiated that it makes the competition inconsequential. Yeah, I love that. And that's what we did. I love that. Yeah. That, I mean, that can apply to any industry. I see that in the supplements, you know, supplement industry. It's like, bad. It's just it's the same kind of, it's just a, where can I get the cheapest product that probably destroyed an environment somewhere that actually doesn't even work and charge the least amount of money I possibly can for it. There, that exists, that exists and you get what you pay for. And once you get on the inside and you start finding out what's actually going on like this, it's like, okay, yeah, no, I'll pay for what it's actually worth to have this the way that I thought it was versus all this garbage that's going on in the background. And unfortunately greed is a part of life, but it's, I love what you're saying. Cause like, obviously you guys have found a lot of success, even though people told you you couldn't, and you just, yeah. you just were like, I don't have competition. I'm just bringing something super valuable to the market. And there's people looking for that. So that, awesome. that was exactly the philosophy. And and I never really answered fully your other question, uh, Tara, about the nutrition. When you put, put the meat in the can directly without pre-cooking it and losing that, that, that juice. And yeah. that, the, our, our tuna actually has about three times as much omega-3 wow. uh, per serving compared to that. conventional. Yeah, yeah. Three times. Wow. And more protein, correct, as well. Well, yes, because there is no protein in water. And so if you put if boiling you, it out, <laughs> right? If you put twenty percent water in the can, there, you, there, you're buying water. That's probably it makes me it. sad. All that's being lost. Are they selling tuna broth somewhere? <laughs> you know, what, you know, what they do with that? That's a this is a great <laughs> side side story. They sell that okay to the manufacturers of fish meal feed that make the pellets to feed the salmon and the other oh, wow. aquaculture fish so that those fish actually have some omega-3 in them. 
it came from the tuna factories what uh, purging yeah oh my gosh it's all this it's just it, it, i always find when we overcomplicate stuff instead of just like I, I i'm actually i did not realize that you it was literally like a line to a fish like and that's basically your guys main thing and i'm like that's nature. That's like how it works is like, you know, and it's just so much less waste overall. It's just, you know, like thinking of the carbon footprint too, probably on all that. Well, because all these, yeah, all these pull and line boats are usually um, uh, local fleets and uh, we, we buy from fleets in the U S in New Zealand, in Japan, in Indonesia, in, in Cape Verde, hmm wonderful local fleet in Cape Verde. They bring all their fish right back to the plant there. It's, it's job creation yeah. locally for the local economy. Totally. And, and uh, the statistic is this, that, that pole and line tuna fishing employs 10 times the amount of people compared to this industrial scale wow. bad per saint fishing. So it, it, there's a big economic factor. And, and then, you know, all those, play, all those fisheries are going back to their home port and discharging these goods in their home port. And they're discharging the mahi or whatever else they caught in. Yeah. Those are being sold locally to restaurants and whatnot. So there's just, it, it is such a clean way of approaching harvesting the oceans, 100%. targeting what you want to catch Make sure it's of the right size. Don't catch the babies. Let them grow up and, and retain everything you catch that, that is then utilized. Yeah. It's and there's, there's so much in it, more in it. I feel like for the fishermen too, because they're like, oh, we got a mahi and now we can also sell that versus just like letting them die, you know, <laughs> or whatnot. So it's very cool. It is. And, you know, there's one more little uh, detail that's, that's connected to that. If I could just share this. Yeah, please. Um, when you buy from these local fleets that exit their home port, fish in their, in their own domestic waters, which is 200 miles offshore, and then come back to their home port and discharge, you're buying product from a boat that is coming and going in, in our case, mainly first world countries that have labor laws and labor law enforcement in port. They have authorities that board the vessels, that check the documents, that check for the welfare of the, of the workers on the boat. All that stuff is enhanced when, when you buy from this small scale fleet. Mm. You know, the stories you hear about the about the slavery aboard fishing vessels and foreign in, in certain countries, those are the boats that, that that go and fish in distant waters, and they don't even come back to a port. They meet up oh, with, wow. with, with a supply ship that brings fuel, groceries, and 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 and, and all the things they need, wow. and sells them that, and takes their fish and aggregates the fish from eight or ten different boats, and then brings them back usually to Thailand, and sells that fish from these boats that are in international waters. Wow. Fishing. And so you don't know unless there's some rigorous reporting right. uh, arrangement for a particular group of boats, the certain boats that are flagged like the U.S. flag boats. It's a different story. They're fully compliant with international law. But, but there are the rogue players that are illegal and that and that should not be supported. And so when you deal with this pull in line small scale fleet, you, you know, you, you've got a much better uh, confidence that 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 social concerns were properly addressed as well. Mm, thank you for sharing that. That makes sense, a lot of sense. So it's nice to get the the straight inside loop and I don't have to <laughs> go find it myself. So I appreciate it. And then Mercury. Okay. So I was always under the impression that the way you guys fish, the fish tend to be lower in Mercury. Is that correct? It is correct. I, it is. And that's, that's only applicable to the Albuquerque tuna. Okay. Which is over half our sales in the United States. <laughs> Americans love albacore. Yes. <laughs> uh, it's the closest thing to chicken breast. <laughs> it this. really is. <laughs> yes. Hey, that'd be a good brand name. Oh, that's taken. Anyway. 
Um, so when we, this goes back to actually a personal experience within my family of someone who, who, who was eating a lot of, a lot of albacore because I mean, it was so good. Yeah. And, and I started reading, uh, in, in 2000 and, and one and two about mercury toxicity. And there was a doctor in San Francisco, Dr. Jane Hightower, who was really specializing in that. And, and I, I called her and, and, and we had some conversations. And my question was, why, why is salmon so low in mercury? And tuna is, so, is, is reportedly so high in mercury. They live in the same oceans, eat essentially the same thing. Yeah. And there's an answer to that. Can you think of what that is? The size. and Boy, you're really close. It's the age of the fish. It's okay. a matter of how, how long, long the yeah. fish feeds in the, in the ecosystem. Right. So all salmon are born in fresh water. They go out and they live in the ocean usually two years, mm. sometimes three, come back and they spawn and they die. Mm-hmm. No salmon keeps living for eight, nine, 10, 12 years. Be, and it, because if they did, they would also be bioaccumulating through right. in the in the ecosystem. So do tuna live that long? They do, sure. Wow. Tuna live but you know, 10, 12 years, sometimes a little more. And so wow. I determined, well, if I could find out what a three, four year old tuna was, it should have mercury levels similar to salmon right, right. and so i studied that and we mm-hmm. segregated and learned that the fish that are nine to 11 pounds are three years old and then 12 to, to 15 are four and 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 up up you go albacore get to be 70 pounds so we tested and we tested we we have hundreds i mean we're close to a thousand mercury tests because we test every year systematically and and watch what's happening in the world of mercury. Is it going up? Is it going down? Or, you know, you know what are the average mercury uh, contents of, mm-hmm. of the catch year to year? And they don't, you know, they don't really change substantially. Anyway, we discovered that a three-year-old tuna actually has a little more mercury than salmon. And I can't answer why that is, but it's really lower than the average tuna on the store shelf. And so that's when we started using the term low mercury in right. 2001, we called it, uh, now I actually called it minimal mercury. <laughs> that, that was my first brand claim and we changed to low. And- um, What is the difference, do you know, like typically? Yeah, so the average mercury in, in the fish that we buy, and we buy fish from nine, to about 25 pounds. That's that's really the range. And the reason we only buy that range of fish is because albacore tuna migrate when they're under six years old. So three to five year old fish migrate and they go from Japan to Oregon, to Hawaii, to the Philippines. I mean, they're all over the place. Wow. And, and, and a fish you know, um, uh, I'm part of the uh, American Fisherman Research Foundation, one of the directors there, and their website has uh, tracking information where you can actually see uh, fish cool. that were tagged and tracked and, and where they go. You can do, use the computer what? model. Yeah, it's cool. That's cool. Yeah, yeah AFRF is the okay. organization. Cool. Yeah, I'll definitely check it out. Yeah, but yeah, so that's how far they range. They they just go all over the world looking for schools of fish. And and they can make it from Japan to, to Oregon in just like three like two or three weeks. They swim like crazy. What? Yeah, yeah. No, the, yeah. Because the fish that we're catching in Japan in May and June, those fish, the same fish will show up in the United States in July and August. Wow. Yeah, they show up. But when a fish turns six years old, they recruit to the to the brood class and they become the breeders Uh and they stop migrating and they live in a totally different part of the ocean and Uh in lower strata. So now they're deep 
they're deep dwelling and they're more interested in breeding than in eating. Wow. And those fish can only be caught with a, with a deep submerged long lines that, that are the, the uh, catch methods that, that we don't use, that, mm -hmm. that are used for other fish. Those are the larger fish. So the average of, of the pole and line catches for wild planet historically average right at about 0 0.17 parts per million. Okay. Which is, um, so 17 one hundredths of a part. Yeah. Okay. The FDA uh, action level is one part per million. And if something is on the market that exceeds one part per million, it's supposed to not be sold. Okay. Now, the average of the FDA results of tuna canning uh, or, or canned tuna in the U.S. over a thousand samples is 0 0.358. So it's a little more than double what the wild yeah. average is. Okay. But, but what you don't have there is you don't have a real sense of how high can mercury go because the FDA tests 12 cans in a group. So one of those cans could have been way right. higher than 0 0.35. And in fact, there are studies that you can find online that show individual can testing, um, mm -hmm. some of which exceed the legal 1.0 oh, wow. million level. Yeah. Okay. Um, the, the highest can, uh, test we've ever had was 0 0.4 parts per million which is two and a half times lower than the FDA limit. Okay, cool. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. That was, so, a, little, that was, that was a little long. <laughs> no, I no, I love it. I, you're answering all the things I've always wondered with Wild Planet. So it's, it's, it's amazing. Thank you. And I, um, I'm like, okay, overall, it's way fresher. It's got three times the omega threes. It's got more protein. All the fats are in there. You're not just slaughtering animals <laughs> and you're supporting fishermen and <laughs> like it's less mercury. I mean, the list goes on and on, you know? And so I appreciate you coming and sharing this with the audience today. Cause I know like it, when I first started buying wild planet, I was like, okay, I heard there's less mercury in this. And they're like, there's something for the planet. Okay, cool. But I didn't know all the details. You know what I mean? And I've picked up little pieces here and there, but you just answered all. I didn't, I was very curious about the fishing practices and what that actually looked like. So thank you for clarifying that for us. And where do you guys, I mean, you guys are everywhere, right? Like I, I feel like I see, I shop at like Sprouts or, you know, I Harmon's here in Utah. What, where can people find you guys? Yeah, well, of course, everyone knows that that, that we Foods. have a, a good presence at Whole Foods. Yes. <laughs> uh, on Amazon, which is also yes. Amazon Whole Foods is now kind of the same thing. Yeah. Uh, Costco, uh, all eight regions That's nationwide. Mm -hmm. And uh, Safeway, uh, uh, all the Kroger banners. Uh, nice. Sprouts, uh, natural grocers, vitamin cottage. One of my favorite customers is PCC in the Pacific Northwest, the Puget uh, Consumers Co-op. Wonderful. Uh, I like to call out the retailers that have a very strict mm. uh, uh, sourcing criteria for themselves. Mm. They don't want to just necessarily have a sustainable option sitting next to all the rest of the stuff. Yeah. And they have only vetted curated sustainable options and mm. and, though, and frankly those those retailers are uh, and there are more than what i'm going to say because there are some smaller ones that do this as well but whole foods uh, uh and then natural grocers vitamin cottage pcc which is why of course i always mention them mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because that's a big deal you know yeah. Wild planet doesn't have products with all these attributes that you so perfectly uh, reiterated at the end of this uh, uh, podcast. We don't just have those as an option and then all the conventional ones right. as an option because we need to make money and, you know, right. we need to have volume. We need, right. you know, I always wonder, and, you know, the, the, there are brands that sell regenerative organic products and then they have the same thing 
in a conventional, like, why would you even do that? Mm -hmm. Are you, are you a vehicle for change mm -hmm. or are you selling stuff? Mm. Mm. Oh, right. we were, boom. <laughs> oh, I just, I just dropped my mic. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, you I, did. Yeah. You really did. That is no, but, and, and a final point. Yeah. And Tara, the, the planet is just a spaceship. Yep. A solar powered self-contained spaceship. Yep. That's exactly and, how I see it. <laughs> yeah, and we can't be, you know, we can't be selling off the parts to make money and then to put that into a Charles Schwab account and have it just sit there. What, what good does that do anybody? I know. We, we need the parts. We need the, the oxygen and the water and the, and the regenerative nature of yes. land and sea. And that's what's behind brand name Wild Planet. It is prolific. It is alive when it's wild. And we cannot domesticate it with impunity. Mm. Thank you. Thank you for um, listening to your soul back in 2001. Thank you for taking massive action. Thank you for providing a way for us, right? To act, like you said, if, the, if no one's selling what's behind these movements, then like, cause I, I always tell my regenerative ranchers, I'm like, thanks for being a rancher. Cause I yes. don't really want to be a rancher, but I definitely want to support this. So like, thank you for doing that part. At least I can just, I can just buy your stuff and like, yay, then I can be contributing to this process too. And so thank you for doing that with the seafood. Thank you for showing up, you know, and, and allowing us to all help too. That's exactly exactly how I see it that I really don't living in Salt Lake City I don't really feel like my voting power matters that much <laughs> just being real like it's kind of per, usually go one way um but with with this this is how I see you know with business with how I, with currency that's to me really what shapes the world so um I appreciate you educating my audience today on like why this matters and I hope you guys go buy some wild planet food it's just straight up I mean <laughs> It matters. This stuff matters, you know, and it's for future generations too. Like you said, like we can't just be so, I don't ever want to be the generation on earth that was responsible for like a major downslide. And in some ways that's happening. And like those of us who are aware, we need to show up. That's how I see it. Yeah. Well, thank you for the acknowledgement, Tara. And thank you for, for giving us a voice and allowing us to connect with your audience and, and with the wild planet customers that we've yet to, to you know, you know, to, to meet. And so yeah. it's my pleasure to be here and thank you for giving us the opportunity. Thank you so much.